Tales from Illyria presents The Stowaway. Well, I don't think friends is the right word, and I don't rightly know they were Tarask, not for sure. They were a little odd, something in the eyes, maybe? Torgan sat in an ornate wooden chair. His hands were tied together around his broad back. It was, he realized, the most uncomfortable chair he'd ever rested his rear upon. Funny how that worked. Across an equally fine desk, its edges carved into standing ocean waves, the Baroness sighed in frustration before thrusting herself to standing. In contrast to the appointments of her cabin down in the hold, the Baroness wore the same simple uniform as her crew. However, where the standard cloak was simple broadcloth, the Baroness's cloak was lined in muslin. The same with her shoes, carefully preserved, luscious leather showing none of the wear and cracking common among the shoes of her sailors. The Baroness didn't put on airs, but she was clearly a creature of comfort. Maybe Torgan could use that. What do you mean they weren't Tarasque? Hmm? Who the damned else would they be? The Baroness practically spit the last word. The thing is, I've heard Crow say it before, and that wasn't what they were speaking. Torgan sounded calm, but he was drawing his account out, desperate for an angle, a story he could use to save his life. Fine. Set that aside for now. Tell me about them. You say you were their prisoner. How did you come to be in their custody? The Baroness sat back down and leaned forward. Torgan was out of time. The only story he had was the truth. Maybe it would be enough. Maybe the Baroness would believe him. At this point, the diminutive Kipik had nothing left to lose. I suppose I'd best start at the beginning then. Here you go then, off with you, you stowaway. The amused lilt in the carter's voice betrayed any attempt at stern reprimand he might have made for Torgan. Shaking his head ruefully, he doffed his cap and motioned to the wooden gatehouse before them. I'll not vouch for you at the gate. You're on your own. He called out as Torgan stepped out of the hay in the cart, brushing himself clean and tossed a lazy wave to the old man at the head of the cart as he sauntered by. Torgan turned. Hey, uncle, don't tell me dad, yeah? His grin was sheepish. His eyes squinted in a simulated wince. Are you kidding, Torg? The old man laughed. You'll be elated to be rid of your trouble, even just for a season. He waved at the gate again. Go on, then. Go fish for your fortune. Torgan wondered at that as he passed through the gates, clutching his pack straps tightly. The guards spared him no more than a bored glance. No need to be vouched at all. Not that Torgan noticed. He chewed at his lip, thoughts of his father on his mind. His father didn't hate Torgan, not really. But to say the old man regarded Torgan with affection would stretch the imagination. His father was fond of saying, You got a foul spirit in you, as he scolded Torgan, but... Even now, the boy had trouble imagining his father meant it. He just wanted more from Dorgan than he was willing to give. But Torgan's uncle probably had the right of it. His father wanted nothing more than to see Torgan take responsibility for himself and leave the home. That had led Torgan to Tidewater Downs, in fact. It was ridiculous on the face of it. The most gregarious of the entire family was his uncle, and... Tidewater was as far as he'd ever come to hawk the straw the family sold. Yet, here Torgan was, moving slowly through a small crowd on the broad wooden walk that both kept the mud off the feet and acted as the tiny fishing village's main boulevard. Torgan was making a beeline for the piers that jutted out over the brackish muck into the blue of the harbor beyond the end of the boardwalk. Even with the crowd, Torgan could already see the tall masts and distinctive triangular foresails of Tidewater's fishing fleet. As he finally pushed past the idlers and emerged on the wharf proper, he caught his first look at the ships themselves. 
a gift from the Chancellor. These seven modified cutters were the seeds which planted this town of Tidewater. Each boat was rigged with a special hold that kept fish alive and awash in seawater without sinking the boat. It was an innovation they'd heard about even in his own town. The village had been founded by decree of the Chancellor and, in exchange for a direct tithe of one quarter of the fleet's take every season, he had supplied its founders with the ships. Rumor had it he'd arranged for the land to be sold on the cheap, too, Torgan remembered. That was sixteen years ago, before Torgan was born, but the ship seemed to glow in the midday sun, none the worse for wear. Torgan adjusted the pack on his back once more and then stepped onto the pier where the ship was moored. Her captain was standing at the gangplank, discussing something with a member of his crew, another of the score of fishermen on the pier. On Torgan's approach, the captain looked down at him dismissively, the hint of a growing sneer crawling behind his mustache. Didn't know. The captain said through his thick black coat of facial hair. Torgan didn't speak Crossi, but he recognized it. He tried answering back in Niran. Beg your pardon? The captain rolled his eyes before switching back to his mother tongue. I said, have your parents lost you, this then, little boy? This brought a thin smile from the crewmen, but to Torgan, he didn't seem amused. You could put it that way, not that they mind, Torgan answered. He glanced over his shoulder, as if expecting to see his uncle nodding back at him. But that's why I'm here. I- I'd like to sign on. This time, the captain's companion <laughs> laughed out loud and said, Fonin, Magisel Rewasautzerar. The sailor nodded his head at Torgan as he spoke. No. The captain said, finally. No? Torgan asked. No. The captain pointed down at the wharf, at the rest of the fleet, and continued. And for them, the same. No children on board. I came of age this year. I can work. Torgan cried, incredulous. Doesn't mean a thing, boy. The answer is still no. The captain jerked his head at Torgan, signaling towards his companion. Time to go, kid. The sailor stepped forward and turned Torgan around, pointing him back towards the boardwalk. At first, Torgan didn't believe what he'd heard, but after hours of rejections from every single vessel in the harbor, he couldn't deny it. He was not going fishing. Whatever fortune, whatever adventure waited him on the deck of one of these broad-hulled cutters, it wouldn't happen with Torgan as a member of the crew. It took another hour for the full magnitude of what that really meant to strike him. Torgan was perched on a stool in the Quayside Tavern, where Tidewater sailors spent their coin. He leaned on the edge of a bar that ran the length of the sidewall of the tavern's first floor. He was looking down at the intricate wooden floor. It was a series of sweeping arcs of multicolored woods, wedged tightly together with alternating lines of black hardwood and a polished white wood that was almost glass-like in its luster. He knew the stilts that held the tavern above the water were just below the floor, but he couldn't see any sign of them. Despite being made from literally thousands of thin strips and cuts, the floor was essentially seamless, held together more tightly than the circumstances of his life, he thought. Everything had fallen apart. He ran away to find his fortune and failed before the first day's light had faded. He'd managed to convince the proprietor to serve him, and he was enjoying the local brew as he realized he'd just spent his last copper oxthart. Well, at least he still had his pack, he thought. The goods inside were meant to last him a trip out to sea and back. They might not secure him a future, but they'd pay for a room at an inn for a few days, and he could figure out what he was going to do in the meantime. Maybe he could sign on with a trader. He smiled at the thought and shrugged his shoulders, which caused the very same pack he had just considered to begin to slide off of his narrow frame. He leaned back and brought a hand up over his head to grab the top of the pack and lift it back onto his shoulders before it fell, but he never got there. Instead, something solid blocked his hand. Something... furry? 
Torgan leaned back to see what had blocked his hand and beheld a shaggy, dark fur coat of a traveler's hooded cloak, his blocked hand still resting weakly against it. The traveler was tall and nearly as broad. From within his hood sprouted a veritable explosion of reddish-brown hair, its ends loosely tied in place around a glass bead that drew it downward from his chin. The lanterns of the tavern caught the traveler's eyes oddly, making them seem to shine, as if they threw back the light sent at them. Torgan quickly let go of the cloak and straightened up as he turned to the traveler. Oh, I didn't see you there, Torgan said in Niran. Tros Raul, the traveler said. His displeasure, like his resonant voice, was dark. He looked at Torgan for a moment longer, then simply turned and weaved his way through the main floor toward the table in the corner. He joined a group already there, five more built like the Traveler and three locals whose sharp, rigid teeth gave them away, even from where Torgan sat. The Traveler was Broodvir. He had to be. But it made no sense to Torgan. They were a long way from home. His uncle had traded with Broodvir once, when he was younger. He called them brutes, and he refused to talk about how they ate, but he also returned with his prized possession, a wooden cudgel, its head carved into a wolf's snarling face. His uncle spoke of returning at least once a year, though he never did. The pelts they wore disgusted Torgan. He couldn't imagine wearing them, the musty smell, the constant reminder that you were wearing the skin of another being. He found the whole idea morbid, but all the same, these six didn't seem like wild things. They spoke quietly, with the rest of their group in that thick, shifting language of theirs, their backs to the rest of the tavern. Each was a mountain of that black-brown fur. Bear, Torgan realized. He wondered if they hunted those bears or took the pelts from the fallen. He'd heard stories of their savagery, but all their furs would amount to quite a lot of killing. As he watched, he couldn't help wondering what they were doing here again. How did they get here? A boat, certainly, but not one of the fleet. Maybe it was all the drink clouding ahead and not really meant for longer-term planning in the first place. For all his bluster... Torgan had little experience with spirits. Or maybe it was simply his mind hoping to salvage something from the ruins of his day. Whatever crazy notion it was, something planted the seed in his mind. Something made Torgan speculate wildly. They were broodvir. They were strangers. They were drinking and eating well. Clearly, he realized, they were raiders. Raiders with treasure! If Torgan couldn't find his fortune fishing, maybe he could find it another way. It would no doubt surprise his father to see him a scant few days later, a fortune of Broodvir loot in his pack. Without stopping to evaluate his plan, he hopped off the stool and made for the exit. The stars were finally out as cooling wind from off the harbor blew into the narrow, elevated boardwalks between structures. Most of Tidewater was raised well off the waterline. Sloped roofs, whose narrow profile presented to the harbor to cut through the wind, were nearly impossible to see from the bottom of the ramps that led down to the quay and the piers that made up Tidewater's wharf. That meant that anyone looking down to the docks from the tavern would have a hard time seeing someone until they were out on one of those piers. This might work, he thought. He made his way down to the wharf until he found their boat, moored in the quay itself. It was obviously the Broodvir's boat, really. It was half the size, maybe less, of one of the fleet cutters. It didn't even have a deck, you just stood on the hull, like a rowboat. That's what it was, Torgan decided. A giant rowboat. A giant rowboat with no oars. He realized he wouldn't find any treasure in a boat like this, and was beginning to rethink his plan until he saw the locked sea chest lashed to the mast. Maybe they were brutes to think a simple lock was going to stop Torgan. He scurried aboard the ship and stood before the chest. He removed his pack and placed it between his feet, kneeling in the same motion to examine the chest's lock. It was a simple iron mechanism, made from a bent bar that hinged into a riveted housing of iron plates, 
a keyhole adorned its surface. Iron was a nice strong metal. Most folks think that strength immediately makes for strong locks, but they forget a lock is only as strong as its weakest part. He reached into his pack and pulled out a silk bundle wrapped with a cord of matching green silk before working free the cord and unrolling the pouch on his knee, revealing a set of fish hooks, each with a different barb and hook shape. Torgan thoughtfully selected two and removed them, then inserted them into the lock. For a few tense seconds, he manipulated the lock. Then, a quiet click broke the monotonous rumble of the water lapping against the hull. Finally, some luck! It had gone on the first try! He'd lost a hook the last time he tried this. He removed his fish hooks from the lock, put them back in the pouch for the rest of his collection, then carefully retied the cord and stored it back in his pack. All that was standing between Torgan and his fortune was the act of opening the lid. He took one more look around the wharf. No one had noticed him, or no one cared. So, he took a deep breath and lifted the lid to behold nothing. The box was empty. A chest that large, lashed to the mast, and it had nothing? Torgan couldn't believe it. Maybe he did have a foul spirit in him. As his defeat came crashing down on him, he realized how stupid an idea it was in the first place. Those travelers probably weren't even raiders. Stupid, naive, Torgan thought. I'd come up with this whole story. They'd fought and come back to tell the tale, a chest full of treasure tied to their mast, braving the fiercest waters. How foolish. The traveler's dark voice called from down the wharf. Torgan looked up with a start to realize the rest of the traveler's crew were only a few dozen meters away between him and any good means of escape. In a panic, he ducked down below the tall gunwales of the Broodveer's vessel and began to cast around for some means of escape. He couldn't swim, but maybe he could float. Only there was nothing in the damn boat he could use to float with. The thing really did have no oars. What good is a rowboat you can't row? They were almost on him, seconds away from being able to see him cowering behind the mast. He looked at the empty chest in front of him. If he balled himself up, he could fit. Where else can I go? He'd just wait till they were asleep and sneak off before they left in the morning. So, with nowhere to go, he crawled into the chest and closed the lid as he folded himself into place. The chest was dark, but Torgan could hear the voices of the crew and feel the vessel list as they each stepped aboard the boat. He didn't know their language, and most of it was muffled by the chest anyway, but it didn't seem like they were settling in to sleep off their drink. If anything, they seemed very active. He heard a splash as something was pulled from the water. The anchor. The boat was pushing off. Torgan was going to sea after all. Torgan lost track of time. Cramped up in that little box as the crew maneuvered the ship, he began to wonder for the first time if he was going to survive. He could die out there in this box before anyone even knew he was there. He could die if they did discover him. Torgan was having a hard time of imagining a scenario where he lived, in fact. He dare not expose himself. He was like a rodent he had seen once. It had been rooted now by a fox a lot that had wandered onto the farm. The thing played dead sitting stone still for 20 minutes, hoping the fox a lot would lose interest, but it never did. In the end, exhaustion took the rodent, and it gave itself away. Torgan didn't know if he was that rodent, but he suddenly understood how it would have felt all the same, and, like the rodent, exhaustion took him. Morgan awoke as the chest was jostled by someone on the boat. Tu areo grohu tot shall routed that thou sit falvald. The chest rocked again. Tot rauden may growlech out eight airfleet. Nehin siaya. The lid of the chest opened and Torgan found himself looking into the amber eyes of the traveler he'd seen in the tavern, the Broodveer. 
without the traveler's fur coat, Torgan could see the broodveer's face for the first time. He wore that explosion of a beard on his chin, and his mustache was parted into braided locks that spilled off the edges of his lips into two small ropes, each capped by another glass bead. He snarled down at Torgan, reaching down to lift him from the chest with one colossal hand. The traveler held Torgan by the straps of his pack, easily holding them in one clenching fist that drew them taut against Torgan's clothes, locking him in place. He hauled Torgan over to the port side of the boat and lifted him over the gunwale. From Torgan's right came the other voice, attached to a slightly smaller version of the Traveler, this one with a short cropped beard of rusty red. He laughed, and his compatriots laughed and cheered his suggestion. Torgan didn't know what was said, but he knew he didn't like their reaction to it. I don't suppose you'll give me a chance to explain? Torgan raised his eyebrow as he asked. He didn't even know if they understood Niran. From the look on the Traveler's face, he figured not. They really were a long way from home. Easy there, friend. He continued in a soothing tone. Let's be reasonable here. Torgan motioned to the deck. Just put me back and let's figure something out, yeah? The tall broodveer's eyes narrowed as he considered what to do with Torgan. Finally, he grunted as he lifted Torgan back inside the boat and dropped him onto the deck. My gratitude, friend. Torgan looked on, hopeful. Does that mean we're reconciled? He turned to look back to what he expected to be the shore, but found there was no shore visible on the horizon at all. Even as he spoke, the traveler was pulling his pack from Torgan's back. He spilled the contents of Torgan's pack onto the deck. A coil of woven rope, a silk pouch that once held Torgan's savings, the hooks, and a wheel of cheese. The sum total of his possessions, save for the clothes he wore. The silk was worth a few dozen ox darts, and the cheese was pretty good, Torgan thought. The traveler, the one he'd heard called Farvald, grunted in disappointment. <sighs> he picked up Torgan's bag of hooks, opened it expecting treasure, and grunted once more when he saw the collection of metal wires twisted for fishing. This from a thin Tauresque manning the tiller at the stern of the boat wearing a tight scowl. I- I'm happy to share. Morgan began offering a tentative smile as he motioned to the cheese wheel. It's from a family farm. Try it. He moved as if to pick up the cheese, and Farvald immediately grabbed him by the shoulder and pushed him back to the deck leaving Torgan on his knees. All right, all right, keep it then. Consider it a gift. Farvald picked up the rope and advanced on Torgan. Before he could react, the mountain of Broodveer had him lashed to the mast next to that damn chest. Two stray day dela in, stray hail and two mega die The last he said with narrowed eyes, pointing his lips and pointing back at Torgan. Torgan got the message. Farvald wasn't interested in talking. So, Torgan sat his back against the mast as the crew set to work sailing. Torgan had no idea where they were, but any time he tried to ask, one of the broodveer would shout or bark at him until he shut his own mouth. They weren't interested in getting to know him. Once Torgan had learned to keep his mouth shut, the boat had fallen into a quiet rhythm. They rode the wind, hauling on the sail whenever they maneuvered or the wind shifted. It went on this way for most of the day. When the coast finally crawled back onto the horizon, the sky was a deep violet. Even though it was still shot through with the light of a sinking sun, the sky was dark enough for Torgan to see lights from a settlement on the coast, twinkling in the shifting, shimmering air. He began to hope that He'd be back on dry land soon, but the Toresk at the tiller cursed, once again wearing a tight scowl as he pointed back off to port. Torgan turned to look. There was a sail on the horizon, a black and yellow with a splash of red at its center. 
At this distance, Torgan couldn't be sure, but he figured he was looking at the heraldry of the Baroness, the black field bearing the yellow shield with the emblem of a red bird. Torgan had never met the Baroness, but he'd heard of her. The Chancellor had awarded her the title, not because of her noble heritage or even her record as a soldier, but because of her efficacy as a pirate in her youth. She was a scourge on the water before the Chancellor had turned her to his side. Now, she ruled from her fortress atop a pile of the Chancellor's gold. The life's ambition of any pirate, a letter of marquee in one hand and the keys to the coffers in the other. She was as lethal as ever, but now she was the bane of any would-be pirate in the region. Behind her, on the horizon, dark clouds roiled and flashed purple-blue arcs of lightning. Still cursing, the Toresque, Torgan had decided his name was Scowl, turned to the boat, pivoting the little raiding ship away from the shore. Torgan looked back, curious to see if the Baroness would turn to follow. Almost immediately, the ship on the horizon trimmed sails and turned. It seemed to grow larger even as he watched. It was practically flying towards them, driven by the leading edge of the storm. Barbo? Scowl asked, worriedly. From that hellfreed dale ot der the tide, rod netter tot fe, no great tre tratze. Farval pointed to another of the broodvir. Torgan had taken to calling this one Broombeard in his head before Farvald had called him Helmfrid and motioned to the sail. Broombeard stepped past Torgan and unfurled more of the sail so that it caught the growing wind. That heita nain vera esto, Farvald. Tal heita o her lausein brood her of dauchum. Torgan couldn't follow the conversation, but he understood tone. Broombeard was worried, like the Toresk. Farvald was angry, but Torgan thought he was probably hiding his fear as well. They hadn't expected the Baroness any more than they'd expected to find Torgan in their chest. They spent more than an hour trying to elude the Baroness, but like the growing storm that drove her ship forward atop white-capped waves, there was no avoiding her. Before long, they were close enough that Torgan could see the silhouettes of figures on the deck. Several of them were standing at the prow. They leaned back and seemed to draw their arms across their chest. Arrows! Torgan yelled, ducking down, even as he realized what he had seen. The crew didn't react, leaving Torgan to wonder if he was going to die lashed to a boat filled with the arrow-riddled corpses of the crew, but as the arrows hissed into the water a few score yards behind the raider, he understood they were out of range. Tali Horel Nehin Hefi Brunlichol, Broad Natil Totefade At Vei Koyer Tire. Farbald was looking back at the Baroness's ship as he spoke. He had to raise his voice. The wind was fierce. The storm was catching up. The Toresk called out. Hertastrail Heta Les Brood Aufhesel, Broad Netter Tot Fei Ocherer De Vaulech. Many of the others nodded at the Toresk's words. Whatever he said, they were all in agreement. All that is, save Farvald. Farvald shook his head. Brot heta nehin, break dog tot, derta shaif heta zaunin brood irzi. He looked back to the storm and now filled the horizon. Both the raider and the baroness ship were running parallel to the approaching storm front, heading south along the coast. Lian brood ante de vadeg. Helmfred, the one he had called Broombeard, shouted a curse at whatever it was Farvald had said. He was shaking his head, signaling no as strongly as he could, but Farvald was quick to shout his reply over the wind. Yo yora dat, brod ak trada inden, brod yora aklik naumden. That got the entire crew shouting at each other, some pointing to shore, others pointing to the storm. Torgan figured they were debating fighting or heading into land and maybe running from there. Torgan hoped they would decide on the shore. Surely they'd leave him in their hurry to get free of the Baroness and her soldiers. Instead, the debate settled down, and the boat heaved into the wind, heading into the storm at the best possible speed it could muster. Incredibly, the Baroness turned to pursue. She had her prey now. She was not letting it slip away. The raider crossed the leading edge of the storm while rain and warm stinging drops driven like arrows by the gale washed across the deck. The ship was tiny against the wind-driven waves, and it lurched up and over wave after wave as it drove into the depths of the storm. Torgan closed his eyes. 
spit back rising bile and for the first time in his life, prayed. He prayed to the virtues, he prayed to the spirits, he even prayed that Oceanus would forgive them for their trespasses on the sea. No one answered. The boat turned this way and that, using the waves trying to lose its pursuer, but the Baroness was relentless. Even as they grabbed favorable wind and shot forward, her ship sat at the edge of their vision, the red and yellow of her sails visible in the growing gloom. As the last rays of the day's light were lost to the storm and time, Torgan watched their pursuers and fought back the bile rising in his throat. He almost welcomed death. Anything would be better than these waves, this storm, and he looked back behind him, that damned boat. It was then that he realized it was gone. The Baroness's cutter was gone. He shouted in joy bringing a harsh look from Farvald, who once again pointed at his lips and then back at Torgan. Even so, Scowl nodded to him with a smile. They'd done it. They'd slipped the Baroness of sight. Now they just needed to survive the storm and get free. Torgan might live, after all. Might. storm was proving itself as relentless a foe as the Baroness. From his position, lashed to the mast, he could see no end to it. From horizon to horizon, there was nothing but thick, dark clouds, sheets of rain, and flashes of lightning. The ocean was so loud, he couldn't even tell if there was thunder. It was disorienting and terrifying. He knew they couldn't be that far from the shore. They hadn't traveled that far in their race with the Baroness, but... All he could see was the storm. Farvald sat at the bow, his face a grim mask as he searched the seas for a sign of the storm's edge. The rest of the crow sheltered against the gunwales. They had started to shiver and had replaced their cloaks. Water sheeted off the bear fur. For a moment, as he shivered in the wet and rain, Torgan thought it wouldn't be so bad to wear another creature's skin. Whatever elation Torgan felt as they lost sight of the Baroness was replaced by misery. The storm might not be as certain a killer as the Baroness, but as the wind sapped what little warmth he had left, Torgan was less and less sure of that. The waves were growing taller, and the intervals of darkness shorter as more and more lightning filled the sky. The boat crested a wave and dipped nearly vertical as it rode down the back. A silver fork of lightning struck the crest of the next wave, filling the area with light. In that light, Torgan caught sight of something. A dark shape in the water. It was massive. A long, sinuous shadow outlined against the wave. A monster. As the light faded, Torgan lost sight of the creature. The boat plowed into the next wave, riding up to its crest. Lightning crashed again, striking the top of the mast with a loud report that had Torgan staring up at the sails in time to watch a widening crack drive its way down the mast towards him. The mast! He yelled, but no one was listening. He tried again. The mast! This time, Scowl looked up at his wild motions and saw the crack as it drove through the span holding the sails aloft. What about the tide? Farvald leapt towards the sail stays, but it was too late. As the mast split apart, it tilted, tearing the stays free on one side and unfurling the last of the sail to flap wildly in the wind. The line lashed through the boat like a whip, taking Scowl at the neck with a sickening snap. He crumpled to the deck, his hands slack on the tiller. The boat began to spin in the trough between the waves. Scowl was dead, Torgan realized and he would soon follow. He yelled at the traveler, Farvald. You have to untie me! Farvald turned to Torgan, his eyes full of irritation even as they widened in fear. Torgan craned his neck to see what Farvald saw and beheld a wall of water, easily 15 meters high. As lightning flashed, Torgan saw the shape in the wave again. It was the last thing he saw before the raider spun in the trough once more and the wave took them broadside. After that, all was water. 
Part 1 of The Stowaway was narrated by Bryce Blankenagel. You can find more of his work at NakedMormonismPodcast.com. Torgan is played by Morbus, the Duke of Otters. You can find his work on YouTube under Morbus, MIA, and all the Chronicles of Illyria discords. The uncle slash Carter is played by Night Fox. You can find him on YouTube and Twitch under Night Fox. He's the little black and white fox silhouette. The Baroness is played by the wonderfully talented Sarah Golding. She's a fantastic voice actor if you're looking for a good voice. The Captain Refusing Torgan was played by me, Zig Smash. All of the Broodveer in this episode were played by, well, me, again, with dialogue counseling provided by Cassie Rilinicki, a fantastic artist and voice actor. Please see episode notes for links to everyone who helped work on this project. This episode was edited and produced by me, Zig Smash, a.k.a. Wayland. You can find more of my work at youareherepodcast.com. Script editing was done by the illustrious Captain Selly. You can find him on most of the discords and Twitch. This episode of Tales from Illyria is pure fan art, of lore written by and belonging solely to Soulbound Studios. Tales from Illyria in no way represents Chronicles of Illyria or Soulbound Studios. Thanks for listening.